Hello everyone. Welcome back to the series of lectures in pulmonology. Today we will be learning about respiratory failure. So let us look at the classification of respiratory failure. So respiratory failure, the first type is called as your type 1 respiratory failure. So type 1 respiratory failure basically refers to acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. So type 1 respiratory failure means there is an acute hypoxemic respiratory failure which means that the saturation or the concentration of oxygen in the blood is reduced. Okay, So the partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries is reduced. PaO2 is reduced. Okay, What is the pathophysiology? This is mainly occurring because of impaired diffusion and gas exchange. So any type of ARDS, right? So this can be maybe due to a pneumonia, it can be due to sepsis affecting the multi-organ dysfunction, finally affecting the lungs or burns related ARDS or pancreatitis related ARDS. So any of this can result in a hypoxemic respiratory failure where the PaO2 is reduced and this is a type 1 respiratory failure. Okay. So here you have a decreased PaO2 and a normal PCO2. So there is impaired diffusion and gas exchange. So any damage to the alveoli or any damage to the alveolar capillary membrane can result in a type 1 respiratory failure. So causes include pulmonary edema, ARDS, consolidation, ILD, presence of pulmonary thromboembolism by because there is an embolus or there is a block to the vessels. So when the vessels are blocked, gas exchange will be affected or presence of even a pneumothorax. So all these are examples of your type 1 respiratory failure. Remember the key word here, it is decreased PaO2 normal PCO2. Decreased PaO2 normal PCO2. Then let us look at type 2 respiratory failure. So type 2 respiratory failure is basically characterized by the pathophysiology of hypoventilation. That means what? There is decrease in your ventilation. There is a decrease in your ventilation. So there is increased accumulation of carbon dioxide. So the ventilation is not proper. They are not able to breathe well. They are not able to remove the carbon dioxide from the body. So there is more accumulation of carbon dioxide and over time they can have hypoxia as well. There is hypoxia plus hypercarbia. Okay, so there is increased carbon dioxide retention along with the hypoxia. So, what are the major causes? The major causes of type 2 respiratory failure includes a decreased respiratory drive. It can be due to chest wall disorders, neuromuscular disorders and obstruction. So, this can be due to a decreased respiratory drive, chest wall disorders, neuromuscular disorders and obstruction. Okay, decreased respiratory drive. So, when does that happen? When does that happen? It, the respiratory center as we all know is in the medulla. So, any damage or any type of insult to the brain, CNS infections, head injury, encephalitis or drugs which suppress the central respiratory center can cause a decreased respiratory drive. Right? So, we know that in the physiology of your respiratory system, whenever the carbon dioxide gets accumulated in the body, the respiratory centers are stimulated and it helps in removing the PCO2 from the body. So, if these centers itself are damaged, then the carbon dioxide cannot be reduced. Okay? So, this can be due to head injury, encephalitis, drugs, especially your sedative hypnotics, right? So, sedatives, excessive sedation can cause decreased respiratory drive. Or for example, even your morphine can decrease your respiratory drive. Then, central sleep apnea syndromes where there is a, a basic problem with your sleep centers and suddenly you can have a cessation of breathing and accumulation of carbon dioxide in your central sleep apnea. Structural lesions which are affecting your medulla Hypothyroidism can also cause PCO2 retention very, very rarely only in severe conditions like mixed edema. Okay. So, decreased respiratory drive is the first mechanism of type 2 respiratory failure. Then, chest wall abnormalities like the presence of kyphoscoliosis or obesity. So, how does obesity cause carbon dioxide retention? It is because of your obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Obesity hypoventilation syndrome or OHS. Okay? So, whenever there are chest wall abnormalities like kyphoscoliosis or obesity hypoventilation syndrome, what happens? So, in obesity or kyphoscoliosis, the chest wall 
is not able to perform its normal expansion and retraction okay because the uh, muscles are not able to work that well because of the skeletal abnormalities in obesity also because of the increased abdominal fat the chest wall is not able to expand well and hence the gaseous exchange is not able to happen properly and pco2 retention happens neuromuscular disorders whenever there is a respiratory muscle weakness whenever there is a respiratory muscle weakness for example in your als which is your amyotrophic lateral sclerosis which is nothing but a motor neuron disease then myasthenia gravis where you can have respiratory muscle weakness especially in generalized myasthenia or in myasthenic crisis then polio then presence of any form of diaphragmatic palsy all of these can cause weakening of the respiratory muscles and pco2 retention then obstruction these are all conditions which we have seen are causes for extra pulmonary these are all conditions which are extra pulmonary extra pulmonary causes for your pco2 retention okay the most common where we see where there is increased carbon dioxide retention is your chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or laryngeal edema so these are intrapulmonary causes okay so presence of a laryngeal edema foreign body can also cause pco2 retention but the most common that you have to remember is severe asthma or cop okay so whenever a patient presents to you with pco2 retention you will have to think of the four major causes remember pulmonary versus extra pulmonary under extra pulmonary remember starting from the cns causes to chest wall abnormalities to neuromuscular abnormalities okay fine so what is the characteristic feature of type 2 respiratory failure it is characterized by the presence of hypoxia with hyperkinesia all right so let us understand clinically how do you differentiate between your type 1 versus your type 2 respiratory failure type 1 versus your type 2 respiratory failure so type 1 respiratory failure it has only hypoxia whereas this has carbon dioxide retention as well in your type 2 type 1 patient has decreased oxygen saturation decreased oxygen within the body as well and the patient usually appears agitated the patient usually appears agitated and restless the patient usually appears agitated and restless whereas in a type 2 respiratory failure they are usually drowsy in a type 2 respiratory failure they are usually drowsy okay in a type 1 respiratory failure what type of a pulse you will have you will have a thready pulse you will have a thready pulse and what type of a pulse do you find in type 2 respiratory failure you have a bounding pulse you have a bounding pulse okay asterixis which is nothing but your flapping tremors right this is your flapping tremors you find it in type 1 or type 2 you find it in type 2 respiratory respiratory failure asterixis is present in type 2 respiratory failure okay so presence of asterixis is a characteristic feature of type 2 respiratory failure then papilledema where do you see papilledema papilledema is also seen in type 2 okay so this is how you predominantly differentiate clinically between a type 1 versus a type 2 respiratory failure and you understood the different causes for both as well so how do you treat your type 2 respiratory failure so treatment basically involves external support through which you can remove the carbon dioxide from the lungs so you give a non invasive ventilator which is your bipap so bipap is basically a bi level positive pressure which you provide so when you give positive pressure to the lungs then the uh, pco2 can be removed so you give a bipap or non invasive ventilation which is the treatment of choice if the patient is too drowsy unable to tolerate a non invasive ventilator then you put him on a mechanical ventilation as right fine so this is the major differences between your type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure and how do you differentiate in three fine now let us move on to what is type 3 respiratory in type 3 respiratory failure initially there is oxygenation failure parenchymal damage and followed by ventilation failure okay so initially the oxygenation itself is failing then there is parenchymal damage and there is ventilation failure So this is commonly seen in post-op atelectasis. In post-operative atelectasis, what happens? The functional residual capacity of the lungs is reduced. So if there is a decrease in the FRC, there is a decrease in the functional residual capacity of the lungs. So this finally results in a lung collapse. Okay. So many parts of the alveoli are not getting recruited for ventilation because they were not oxygenated well. 
and there is a collapse of the lung. So the treatment basically involves non-invasive ventilation for your type 3 respiratory failure as well. Then type 4 respiratory failure is basically occurring because of decreased perfusion to the respiratory muscles. There is decreased perfusion to the respiratory muscles which is commonly seen in shock. So the management of type 4 respiratory failure basically involves increasing the blood pressure which will in turn increase the perfusion. So there is this is brought about by increasing the blood pressure which in turn increases the perfusion. Okay. So this is about your type 4 respiratory failure. Fine. So, this is about the different types of respiratory failure. How do you differentiate type 1 from type 2 clinically and what is type 3 and type 4 respiratory failure? Thank you.